Well, hey, hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Amazing Seller Podcast. This is episode number 353, and today is going to be part one of something that I haven't really done before, and this is a live product brainstorming session, and part two will be a website teardown where we talk with other e-commerce experts and people that have been doing this for a while, and those people are Noah Kagan. I had him on the show before. He was episode 342, and then Ian Schoen from Tropical MBA, so another great guest, and then Steve Chu, a repeat guest on our show here. He was on episode 93 and 323. Really excited to have him on as well, and what this was here, let me just kind of talk about how this whole thing kind of happened. Noah had reached out to me and said, hey, You know, maybe we should get together sometime and uh, we can kind of do this round table thing and uh, and maybe get Ian on, maybe Steve, maybe you, and we can just sit around and kind of talk about product research and brainstorming and how to test and validate and all that stuff. And then he went ahead and he asked people on his Facebook page, would they like us to review their website? So all they had to do is just submit their website. So we picked three websites. And the way that we approached this was, let's take these websites with fresh eyes and land on the page and then talk about how we would improve it. And all of these products have to do with physical products, but it's a website that you would land on if you were just searching for something related to these products. So that's going to be in part two. So you're going to want to definitely listen to this one, part one, and then part two will be the website teardowns which is, again, another great session. And this was actually recorded for all of us to share if we wanted to. So I went ahead and I took all the highlights and it went on for almost a couple of hours. So I broke it down, got really to the meat of it. And I think you guys will get a ton of value from this recording. And just imagine being at the table with all of us and just digging into this topic. And I had a blast doing it. And I felt like, again, I was not the smartest guy at the table, which I never want to be, which is great because I learned a ton as well well going through this process and I really enjoy doing it. So definitely listen to this episode and listen to part two because you guys are going to get a ton of value. There's tons of golden nuggets scattered amongst these episodes. Now, the other thing I wanted to do really quickly is just remind you on the show notes, you will want to download the transcripts to this episode and part two. That'll be coming next. But right now you can head over to the amazingseller.com forward slash three. 53, and then you'll get all the transcripts, all the links in the show notes that we talked about will be there on that page. So guys, I'm going to stop talking because this is a great episode. You guys are going to enjoy it. I'm fired up for you guys to listen to this awesome conversation that I had with my good friends, Noah, Ian, and Steve. So enjoy. Uh, Brag the most about yourself in 15 seconds and give us the, how much you've made in e-commerce revenue so that people can take you more seriously. I want some status updates or some brag updates. Steve so this is this is going on your podcast. I originally thought everyone could take the episode and put it in their in their own, and that's just up to you guys if you want. Okay, uh, but it's going on yours for sure, right? Yes. Okay. Well, well in that case, if it, sucks, if it sucks, I'm not gonna put it out. But if it's great, I'm gonna put it out. I see. No, okay, because I'm tailing my intro. Like, all right. So this is going on your podcast. In that case. It's your boy Steve Chu, aka Papa Panda, aka Chufucius, aka the Emperor. <laughs> I run, <laughs> I run a seven-figure store called Bumblebee Linens. I started it back in 2007 before there were all these popular platforms around. Uh, grew to six figures in profit in the first year, and it's been growing in the double and triple digits ever since. That led to my uh, blog at mywifequitterjob.com, where I kind of document my experiences running my store, which has led to a popular podcast and an e-commerce conference called The Seller Summit. Damn, one. Four plugs, one intro, 15 seconds. Impressive. Like, like the Asians always overdo it. He, he prepared, though, for that. He prepared for that. Don't let him yeah. fool you. The <laughs> Asians are like, oh, I don't, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. A plus. All right. Uh, Ian Show and hit it off. I'm a little bit slower. I don't know if I can do this in 15 seconds, but uh, 2007, 2008 time frame. Um, me with my business partner, me with my business partner, we started an e commerce site. We were selling Valley parking equipment. Uh, Grew that into portable bars, grew that into cat furniture. Um, It was a mid seven figure e commerce operation, had product design, manufacturing, sourcing, and sold it in 2015. And since then, I've just been kind of hanging out on the porch. Um, Not not all all hanging out on the porch. So Noah comes over once in a while. Um, (laughs) 
start started a uh, blog and a podcast back uh, around 2010 called the Tropical MBA, um, and that's where we were musing about the uh, the company that we used to own, and now we interview other people that are running successful companies. All right, all right, Scott, let's the up. finale. Yeah, right. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go a little different angle here. Um, the most thing that I want to brag about, I think, is that I've been married for 22 years. Can I hear a round yes. of applause on that? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's impressive, right? Man. That right? is really impressive. And yes. my wife has been my partner in a lot of those businesses that I've come up with. So, uh, yeah, and she's been a huge supporter. So, yeah, basically, uh, I'm a dad. Um, that's my first and foremost uh, passion. And uh, I've, I've created lifestyle businesses. Uh, no college degree, never stepped foot in college. Um, and uh, was able to uh, build a photography business locally, a six-figure business um, that allowed us to work from home. And then from there, started selling on eBay and um, some of our own digital products uh, on CD. And that's really where my first product was kind of sold. Uh, but then since, have built uh, multiple uh, six-figure businesses um, in e-commerce and in digital. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's pretty much my, uh, my spiel in a, in a nutshell. And Scott, for a lot of people who don't know, from my audience, he was actually a construction worker. So a lot of yeah. the times they're like, oh, Noah, you're already like Jewish, so you have oh, an advantage. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, literally someone who was a construction worker, not without the experience, not without college, was able to do this. So I, we have a good show for you guys today about how to be the best in e-commerce. So let's just get going and, and go back to the, the basics. Like for each of you guys, uh, you know, what was the first product you sold online? Like how did you guys sell your first product to make your first dollar with your e-commerce business. So maybe we can go backwards uh, in reverse with Scott to, yeah. and you know just jump in where other guys want to jump in. Yeah, cool. My first uh, online uh, sale was really uh, wooden cedar bridges that I found. Uh, I was doing a little bit of retail arbitrage back then. Oh, what, I didn't even what know what that? it was. Uh, what's that? What is a wooden cedar bridge? It was a wooden cedar bridge for a garden. So little four foot bridges. Um, and I, we, my, my wife and I seen that these things were selling on eBay and we had no idea what we were doing, but we said, you know what, let's try to sell these things. Cause we, we seen, we could buy them for like 25 bucks at a local store. We sold them for like 130 bucks a piece and they were selling like hotcakes. We were buying 20 at a time, how, filling up a little minivan. Even, how did you even, hold on, stop for a second. Yeah. I wanna, how did you even think to like, <laughs> oh, there's wooden bridges. Like I can put them on eBay and make money. I'll, like, t- I'll tell you. That yeah, I'll tell you exactly. I, I think I was selling something else just cause I was, I got rid of it. I was getting rid of something like something around the house and I just, Oh, everybody's saying that you can sell it on eBay. Let me just go ahead and put it up there. And like within like two hours I had like five bids and I'm like, Holy crap. Like I never knew you could sell something online. I mean, this is going way back. And then I started looking at other things that people were selling and started looking around the house and stuff. And then my wife had said that uh, she's seen uh, that these wooden bridges were, you know, people were buying them and sell or, you know, buying them off of eBay. So I said, well, well let's just try to, you know, buy some and sell them because she had said she had found some at a at a store. So we kind of looked it up and just kind of reverse engineered it. And and we actually put our kids through private school selling those wooden bridges. Um, so so one thing to add, Scott, I think yeah. this is what we talked about on on your show which is just like for anyone out there who's like, I don't even know what kind of business to start. Just grab all the in your house or yep. all the stuff in your friend's houses yep. or your office or wherever it is and just start putting it on eBay or Amazon or Etsy. Just get yeah. it going. Yep. And then you'll probably find some type of angle or thing that that should work for you. Yeah. No. So, I mean, so just again, just to kind of really wrap up. So that was like the just the thing that got me kind of like excited. But then from there, uh, we had a photography business, a brick and mortar business. And then I started seeing that people were selling uh, different templates and stuff online um, or on eBay. So I started selling my digital uh, wedding templates on eBay. And that was really my first fledged biz- business in the, the e-commerce world as far as like it was a physical product, but it was a CD. Um, so that was kind of, um, that, that was my first How, round. How do you feel? Because, you know, you're doing construction work, you're doing manual oh, labor man. all day, and now you're like, you know, throwing, Dude, I just keep thinking in the, yeah. gar- the gardens of Madison County oh, and, uh, or bridges of Ma- and you're throwing and you're just making easy money. Like, how did that feel for you? It was insane because I've dreamt of it. You know, I was out there on the construction site. Like you guys have probably seen the guys are out there on the roofs or, you know, in the hot sun or in the cold winters. Cause I was, I was in upstate New York and, um, I dreamt of it. I mean, I did all kinds of things. I mean, I was even in Amway. Imagine that. Way back uh-huh. when in the day, I went to meetings and all that, you know, so. What's Amway? Is that like Alcohol Anonymous? No, <laughs> it's a MLM. <laughs> yes. Yeah, MLM. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, think, I think a lot of uh, us entrepreneurs have, have gotten started in, in that way, but uh, it definitely introduced me to the business uh, concept and stuff. But yeah, so uh, yeah, I was a hard, uh, a hard laborer uh, for construction and then um, just never thought I could do it. And then I started getting the, the taste for it on eBay and that kind of, I guess, uh, gave me all of the knowledge to kind of keep moving and, and the motivation to keep doing it. Ian? Yeah, so back in, um, geez, back in 2007, uh, we started our first e-commerce uh, company and it was uh, selling valet parking products. So uh, going through college, part of my, uh, part of the way that I paid for everything was as a valet parking attendant. Um, I thought it was a, a cool way to drive nice cars. 
Um, and then I got out of college. Like your, do you have a favorite valet story? Um, I mean, back in the day, like most of the stories are like, uh, you, you know, you get like a big rush that you're not expecting. And of course, like it's a bunch of like degenerates working at the valet, you know, that's nice. To uh, know. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like well, okay. well, maybe is there something that most people don't know about valet? Should we not be doing valet? Like, uh, it really depends. I mean, if you, if you go onto YouTube, you can see plenty of destruction going on, but I mean the, the valet industry or the people that work valet are not so dissimilar to the service industry, you know, the cooks and the waiters and things like that. So they all like to party they all spend every dollar that they have. That was me. Um, and so, you know, there was many days where you're very hungover, you come up to work and all of a sudden there's a rush and you're puking behind, puking behind the uh, parking garage. Cause you're having to run around like a crazy man. So, um, so anyways, I was a valet parking attendant, uh, got out of school. I went to school for product design, um, and started working at a firm. And then I just started to look around. Um, I just had like a different lens. Um, and I saw these valet parking stands um, did a little bit of research. They were all manufactured at the time in the United States and they weren't manufactured very well at all. Um, the equipment hadn't really been thought through. It was um, clearly designed like by mom and pop operations out of necessity. Uh, no one had figured out how to make it efficient for shipping. No one had figured out how to make replacement parts for it. No one had really thought through the industry. Um, and at the time, a lot of these valet parking companies were uh, turning from small mom and pop operations to big corporations. And none of these companies knew how to speak corporate either, the ones selling the equipment. So we saw an opportunity to start making um, that equipment. And that's what we did back in 2008. And the way I got started in e-commerce was um, I kind of had an idea of what I wanted the valet equipment to look like. So we designed it, we developed it. Um, I had $50,000 worth of equipment on a container coming over from China. And I had no idea how to market this stuff through the, through the internet. Um, and on, so, so it was at that on, point. On, 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 one second, just taking a step back. So sure. how did you, so you see valet, you're like, oh, I can make a better valet box, right? Correct. And then did you just like draw it on paper or did you use CAD? Like, what did you like? That's the part you just jumped to like, oh, then I had stuff coming from China. Yeah. So I, I drew it on CAD. So I went to school as a product designer. So that was part of my skill set was being able to design products. If someone doesn't have that knowledge, like let's say I want to design a better garbage sure. can, because I think garbage cans are overpriced. I don't know if that's just totally me. overpriced. So yeah, so how the, do I, so the way to hack it, it yeah. it's very easy. So if you go over to China, um, and this has been the case for a long time, if you go to them with a sketch or a half an idea, they're unlike American, unlike a lot of American uh, manufacturing companies, they will put in the design and development work to make that product for you. So you, where do you find those kind of people now, or where would uh, you? I used to make pilgrimages i mean i used to go over there for a month two months at a time hang know, out but in you just like show up in china and you're like hey it's a white guy you know yeah, <laughs> absolutely yeah i mean i had a fixer so i had a guy that spoke the language and that could take me around to all the different factories i mean these days you know a lot of people sell on amazon and ebay and all these sites you know it's it's relatively easy to find products through alibaba and things like that but i i was looking for unique manufacturing capabilities and unique products and you know to do that i was on the ground over there so one thing I think you've mentioned to me in the past is that when you actually get a product and you kind of like the way that it's made, you can actually just look on their tags or their stickers to see and try to work backwards who the manufacturer is. Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way that the way that China is set up is is actually in in like small towns or small communities of um, of manufacturing expertise. So if you want to get buttons made, chances are like you're not just going to go to one button factory in China. You're going to land at the button factory and then all the neighbors around that factory are also going to be making buttons. Um, and so there's a lot of efficiency there in the way that they're set up. So, so for most people, oh, oh, excuse me. Go ahead. No, it sounds like so for most people, if they don't have the skills of being able to design a better one, it's like find a product or I guess I don't know. How, how would you find a fixer? I'm just so trying to think of like I want to make my garbage can. How do I do that? Find an existing manufacturer of garbage cans. Um, whether it be on Alibaba or directly in China. And chances are they're going to help you to create a, a better garbage can. So one of the rules that I use is like most products, I mean, sophisticated products are made up of uh, many different materials. Um, so you might be like wood, plastic, metal, figure out what the majority of that material is. So let's say the majority of a valet stand is metal. I'm going to go find a metal manufacturer that makes something that looks like valet parking equipment. For example, toolboxes. Um, and then if you have plastic or something like that, that you also want to add on to the unit, a lot of times they will subcontract out for that plastic. So your manufacturer will do a lot of that work for you. Does okay. That make so sense? You, yeah. So they'll actually do the work once you found the person. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so you don't need a design. You don't need a background in design or anything like that. I mean, it was very helpful for me um, because I was able to get exactly what I wanted kind of, you know, in the first and second try, whereas you'd probably have to go through a lot of different iterations with these factories. Um, so you, so, you, oh, excuse me. Go ahead. It was helpful. So you make the design and then you find a fixer who gets you the, the people in China and then they send you $50,000 worth of valet boxes. <laughs> yeah. And you so, had you sold any at that point? So we hadn't sold any. So I didn't know what my plan was. I think my plan was like, okay, get this thing designed, order it. And then as soon as it got on the water, I kind of started to panic because I had all this money out there. Number one. Um, number two, I didn't actually know the quality of the product. I mean, I'd ordered the sample. Um, but, you know, as I found out later on in China, not necessarily what you order is what you get. So I had all this product coming over and I had, I mean, I wasn't like an internet power user at the time. Like I kind of understood what search results were and like how the internet worked, but I like was very far away from understanding SEO. And so that was the first thing we did was we basically sat down and we're like, all right, we have to figure out how to get this site to number one. And one of the ways that we did it back in the day, I think this was like 2007 was we signed up for things like Yahoo what was it like Yahoo commerce listings or something like that? I mean, it was like pretty rudimentary back in the day, but, uh, that first year we spent tons of time understanding how to, uh, how to manipulate the search results. What, what was like your first sale? Okay. So the way that we actually sold the product, um, I think, I don't know if people think this is sketchy these days, but back then it was definitely sketchy. Um, we had a rendering of the product. So it was like a computer generated image. We put up a website and then we started cold calling people in the valet industry. And then also, you know, as we got better at SEO, uh, yeah, our Ian, can you say it again? started to increase. And so, hey, oh, Ian, you, sure. you kind of cut out right at the good part. So how okay. did you get the first sale? You, you were starting to say something shady, which I liked. Sure. So, yeah, what we did was uh, we made a computer rendering of the image. Um, so it wasn't actually the image. It was just what we took out of our solid modeling program. Uh, we took an image of the valet equipment. We put it up on a website. And we put a buy now button and we started cold calling valet parking companies and eventually, you know, our rankings started to increase. So as soon as we got a couple of sales, um, we would, uh, we would respond back and say, Hey, this product is out of stock. Thank you for your interest. We'd refund their money immediately. And, uh, that was basically how we validated the products. Oh, so you guys listed it on your site and sold them even before you even got them. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. And then when people actually were like, hey, I want it, you're like, oh, we don't have them right now. And then yeah, that's when we you said we're out of stock. Mm -hmm. Was that why you, before you order them or afterwards? That was like as we were going through the ordering process. So I think at that time when we launched our website, like we we had already negotiated with the factory, like the pricing and like what the design was going to be and all that stuff. But we didn't actually have the products in stock. It was going to be a couple months. But I think uh, if I'm remembering, this was a long time ago. We, we got our first sales before we actually paid for the purchase order in China. So you got listed online. People would buy it because you had a basically a fake page. I mean, a pre-order page now is what they call them, Kickstarter or right, just exactly. you know Shopify, whatever it is. And then you, that validated that oh, shit, people actually buy this. Yeah, exactly. Do you remember how you got links back then, or how you got people to actually oh, like? Man. So one of the things we did was, uh, gosh, this was like way back in the day. We actually started our own um, link network. Um, I don't, I don't even know what they call it anymore, but it's like a private link network. It's like a, it's, um, like a, a, a uh, it's like your private blog network, right? Yeah. Yeah. We did that. Um, we actually started a directory for our industry. Oh, okay. So no one else was doing that at the time. Like no one else had pulled together all these, these companies. So we started approaching them and saying like, Hey, we're going to put you in this directory. And you know, at the time, none of these valet companies knew what SEO was either. So it was like, Oh, this manufacturing company, they're going to supply us with supposedly better equipment. Um, which I think we did. And they're also going to list us and they get rankings. When I type in valet parking, they come up first. That's pretty sweet. Um, so that's one of the ways that we got links back in the day. All right, Scott, set it off. What was the first sale? Oh, no, not Scott. Steve. I was going to say, come on, man. I, I already did that. <laughs> Dude, my story is a lot geekier, man. Um, so I used to go on Craigslist, comb the computer listings. And what I would do is I would buy the computer system, strip it apart, and then sell off the pieces for a lot more money. How did you know you could do that? How did you know you could make money doing that? Because I was trying to sell my computer stuff and I noticed that people were overpaying and then I noticed that people were selling this stuff on there really cheap. Um, that career came to an end real quick though because I ended up like in a bad neighborhood one day <laughs> to pick up these hard drives and like it was out of this guy's van and then like it was, it was hard drives, I remember. And then he cut, like all the hard drives had like the cables cut 
and then it was just a box of drives. And he's like, do you want them? Meanwhile, like I, I had my Stanford sweatshirt on. I had my like glasses on like an Asian in like an all like black neighborhood. So I ended up just like buying all those and then I left and that was the end of my career there. So it's kind of interesting. You and Scott both just did things out of necessity and, and noticed you, know, you were observant about what's working. People actually really want more of this. How do I get more of those? And that actually got you more into e-commerce. Yeah, I mean, I was just doing for fun. Um, I was I was just doing for fun, really, just some spending cash. No, but actually <laughs> in Berkeley, this is, you know, it's funny now. It sounds so archaic, but like Craigslist and eBay and Amazon, I don't even think had their marketplace were really early. So I would buy broken or laptops on eBay and then arbitrage them to Craigslist and vice versa. And I, similar to you, I stopped doing it because uh, I sold one to the Philippines. And it was one of these things where like everyone's like, oh, don't sell it to the Philippines. You're going to get scammed. And I was like, no, this person, it's her name is Stephanie. She's definitely there. <laughs> like She promised me it's OK. And then I sent the laptop. It was a Sony Vio little one. And then a week later, it's like that account was hacked. We're taking the money and you lost the laptop. And I was like, all right, this is maybe not for me. Yeah, for me, I was like fearing for my life because I was ending up going to all these sketchy neighborhoods to buy stuff. So, yeah. So let, let's before I want to definitely go into a few of the listeners websites before we even get into that. I kind of want to know how you guys think about going about it now that you've done this for so many times. Right. Like maybe let's go back to a new beginning if you're starting today. So, for example, let's let's just say I, I create a garbage can. Right. Like Noah's Noah's garbage. Um. So I create Noah's garbage. How do you guys go about getting it to like a thousand dollars a month through e-commerce? Like, I'm just curious how you guys would even start processing that and going about it and then trying to create somewhat of a framework that other people can replicate from this. I mean, for me, like I'd, I'd have to know what's special about the garbage can first. So like what's special about your garbage can and is there a market for it? You know, I like the the waving thing. Have you guys seen it where you wave and it just opens, yeah. but it breaks down after a while and they're a hundred dollars. Like I think they should be cheap, like 30 bucks. And then just have a better motor so they don't break down after like, you know, a week. Is that not okay, interesting? Okay, so your garbage can <laughs> is uh, is $30. It has a waving motion sensor on it. What else does it have? You know it would be cool? If it had like a little counter and it shows how much garbage you're using. So it's, got like, like a, maybe, it's got like a gauge on it so it shows you how full it, it is? Yeah, or ooh, either how full it is. I mean, I guess what's the problem with garbage? I don't know. I, I guess... Well, maybe even taking a step back, how do you guys even go about figuring this out? Like well, what here, kind of things? Here's, here's, here's my take on it though, Noah, real quick is like, first off, like, okay, I think we all can have like really great ideas, but I think the one thing that Amazon allows us to do is see the product that's, you know, products that are currently selling and then looking at the reviews and seeing what people like and what they don't like. I think that's like the easiest way to kind of, kind of test a market, see a market because it's already there. You don't even have to do any of the work. You can just kind of spy on the competition. Why don't we do that for garbage cans while we're talking? I'll pull up Amazon. I mean, and then from there, you just dig into, and, and again, you might have stuff on your bucket list, but like things that you like, who, maybe two other people would r really care. I don't care if I can see if mine's empty. I'll just lift the lid, <laughs> right? But for you, it might be important. You, maybe, maybe you don't want to lift the lid. Um, you know what I mean? So I think there, there's, there's different uh, needs and wants for those people. And I think, again, if we're looking at it, we got to be able to validate the market even exists um, be, before, you know, putting in like Ian, I mean, he put in 50 grand in before he really, I mean, he knew there was a market, but you didn't re I mean, I, I don't know, Ian, it, what was there like, was there already product that was selling like yours or did you just come up with something and said, I think people are going to like this. Yeah, there was already product that was selling. And I think that's a, that's an important distinction to make, you know, is, uh, the, the least successful products that I've ever sold are ones that I've developed myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so good point. like I had an idea about something Ooh, and I good. thought it was great. And uh, it turned out to always be a flop. So, uh, you know, when I look to develop a new product, like I look to who's selling the best product out there. Um, I generally like to be at the top of the market, not at the bottom of the market. And what innovations can I bring to that industry or what innovations can I bring to that product? And I think uh, to Scott's point, you know, like looking at Amazon reviews and seeing well, trying first of all, trying to sift through the real ones. That's yes. a big yep. challenge these yep. days. Yep. And then trying to actually figure out you know, what people want in a garbage can. I think that that's important. And it's, so not, I pulled up, it's yep. never my ideas, by the way. And it, I think a lot of people that are selling and making products would agree with that. Like, I, I, even as the product manufacturer, I generally don't have the best ideas. It's the customers that do. Mm -hmm. I just pulled up some garbage cans just for kicks here. Um, here are some complaints about some of the uh, metal garbage cans out there. Uh, the containers are a lot smaller than I thought. There's no way you could put a cereal box in the recycling side without smashing into a ball. Uh, the trash bags didn't fit perfectly. Like there was a lot of give on there. Mm. So based on this feedback, we could probably create a, a better trash can. And 
<laughs> well, I, you know, it's funny. The one that I actually bought before the uh, nine stars. So I, I really like where you guys went with this, which is just like, I think sometimes we, we solve our own problem, which is good, but you also have to make sure that people actually want to pay for that. Yeah. I think that's a really great point. And just because it's selling on Amazon, I personally don't think it's guaranteed to have, be a success uh, for yourself. Um, uh, you know, let's say we, we like this nine stars. So they have a touchless gas uh, garbage can. And the, if you look at their one and two stars, the number one complaint everyone's doing is like it broke really early. Mm-hmm. Kind of what I mentioned before. Cheap, yeah. So so it's cheap. There's no warranty. I can't call anyone. Um, so does that what do we do from here? Like, it seems like this is like an opportunity that like, you know, make one that actually doesn't break and then they can contact someone. Yeah, I think that's the easiest solution, right? I mean, fix those 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 really those those simple problems that you see on the surface. And I think um, I think, Ian, like you had said, like, you know, how do you sift through the ones that are real? I think you're going to see more of the ones that are five star that aren't as real, you know, than the ones that people are complaining. Yeah, we're going to have sometimes you have competitors that are going to jump on there and try to bring your listing down. For the most part, though, I think if we look at those, we'll get a good understanding, especially if they're being repeated. Um, so I, I think I think right there, I mean, making the bag fit better. So there's I mean, so you're actually using the 13 gallon bag and not just, uh, you know, 10 of it. Um, I think that's that's something that you can look at. I think you can look at, like you said, if it breaks too too easily, why is it breaking? Like what part broke? Um, you know, um, is is it lightweight material? Can we can we increase the gauge of steel or, or stainless steel that they're using? Um, you know, so like I think those are like great ways. The other thing is too is don't is maybe just don't go there. But you know, you can you can go at other marketplaces and look at the reviews there. I mean, look at look at Sears, look at JC or not JC Penny, look at um, any of the other, Walmart or any other ones that have reviews, um, Home Depot, any of those, and just start just start to kind of uncover some of those simple ones that could be easily tweaked. And then you're going to call those out as yours is the better one because yours has this, this, and this, which your competitors had all complaints about. So that would be my angle. So if I have, so I, I think making it not break, I think sounds like the number one thing. Mm-hmm. And two, maybe having like, hey, how much garbage have I used? So it's kind of like, I don't know if that's negative reinforcing. I don't know if I actually want to know that. <laughs> I think it'd be cool if it just tells me when to take it out. It's like, well, I guess we already know that too. It's not really that like, you know what I mean? It's like you I'm fucking not open. liking this product, but yeah, go on. I'm not liking it. Well, so that's my, okay. So I think the thing I want to get clarity on though is like I come up with my garbage can idea that's just not going to break or I, and what do I do with that? How do I actually see if people want to buy it? I think there's a couple. Like, how things. do you guys do? I, I, like, I, I was going to say, I mean, a, a, I think there's a couple things that I want to highlight here first. So this garbage can, are you thinking like you're just going to sell this one off garbage can and you're just going to, you're going to run with that one garbage can or is there other products that you're going to be serving to this? Is it going to be a brand? Is it just going to be one, one hit wonder? Well, like well, what's it going to be? Just, Taking a step back, it's more like I want everyone who's listening that has like, hey, if I created a product, like how do I actually get someone to buy it? Right. right? And how do I then also get someone to make it? Right. So and, I, you know, that's yeah. the part I'm looking for. What kind of process okay. you guys go through when you're thinking about your products? I, I think I think another simple test is kind of doing what Ian did, but you can do it now very easily with Facebook ads. I mean, you can literally just go target people and put up a landing page and ask them to uh, whether they buy it or whether they want to be notified when it's available or something like that to at least get some interest level. Um, that would be one angle um, that I would have. The other thing too, you know, and this is like, uh, we, we haven't talked about like specific um, platforms yet, like Amazon or Etsy or eBay or anything like that. But you know, th- these days I think you have to understand what you're trying to accomplish. And Scott mentioned this too. Like, are you trying to make a one-off um, product? Are you trying to create a brand? Are you trying to compete with other professional, what I'll call professional sellers on Amazon, meaning people that are market focused and not necessarily product focused? Um, you know, and that and there's a rabbit hole there, but basically meaning like there are a lot of people on Amazon right now that are market focused and they will attack a market and they will flood it with their professional experience and make it very hard for you to compete with them. Um, so that might not necessarily be the best place for you to introduce know your new trash can, especially if it's not a differentiated product from much of what's out there. So, you know, if this was my product and I was hell bent on building a, a trash can, I think I would probably I, I would probably go with old school content marketing to begin with, right? Like I would start talking about trash cans, I would talk about the problems with trash cans, I would try and develop a line of trash cans that solved a multitude of different needs. Um, I might do Facebook ads. Um, but I would also question whether or not I wanted to be in the trash business too, right? Yeah. Because if I'm developing this line of trash cans, like I better be willing to talk about it. Better be willing to talk about it like five years down the line, you know? I think um, I would probably get a couple of samples made and just see if I can unload them on eBay. That's good. Idea, um, yeah. Also. Yeah. Um, Cause that's kind of how we started our business. We, we sold on eBay for a while until we knew there was demand before we actually placed a large order for them. And by that time, we already knew that we could sell them. In the worst case, if we didn't sell them on our shop, 
then we could at least liquidate them on eBay. So there's tools like Terapeak out there that will tell you all the sales. They collate all the sales for you on eBay, so you can get a pretty good idea. What, what site was that? Terapeak. Terapeak. How do you spell that? T-E-R-A-P-E-A-K. It's basically a scraper for eBay. It tells you what all the completed listings are. Yeah, it's a good tool. Definitely. It's been out for a long time, too, right, Steve? It has, yeah, for, for as long as I can remember. Actually. I've never used it. Okay, you guys are professional. Well, the cool thing about um, <laughs> <laughs> completed listings is actually taking people's money. So it's not like yeah. what products were sold, but it's like who actually paid money for this product. Yeah, it's a great point. So, Steve, you would go and – so it's, it's interesting. It's almost kind of like three different approaches. So, Scott, you were saying maybe do the Facebook ad to a landing page to see people pre-order – Ian, you're saying Etsy potentially or content marketing as a way of validating the product. And then Steve, you're saying put it on eBay or use, you know, to see if people buy or use Terapeak to see if there's a market demand for it. I think so. I mean, assuming we all have samples already, right? Yeah. In, in all our scenarios. Yeah, I would just try to sell it on eBay and see what happens. Well, so two questions I, uh, I'm curious from here is like, Ian, if I wanted to make my trash can that would work better than this one, would I just try to find the manufacturer of the original one? What would you do? Yeah, I think I would probably go over to China. I would find out where all these uh, people are manufacturing their trash cans. Like I said, they're probably in one concentrated area in China, and I would figure out what their shortcomings are of that. So if everyone's saying, you know, the motor's breaking or the, um, you know, the optics aren't working on the trash can, well, I would figure out what model of optics that is, um, and I would figure out what the step up from that optics is. And you could probably do that from interfacing with these uh, these companies in China. The I guess for you guys, like on the flip side, what products, Ian, you mentioned something like what products have you guys created that you thought there's going to be a big market for? Why did you think that? And, and why did it flop? Um, so the product, the product that comes to mind for me is um, we were um, in the uh, cat furniture niche. So I had this idea because I'm a cat owner that uh, cats, cat owners like to spend a lot of money on their cats, too, but they don't get the opportunity because um, there aren't enough products. Whereas you go into Petco or PetSmart, um, it's just chock-a-block full of dog products. And so that was our thesis. It was like, hey, these cat owners are willing to spend just as much. They just don't have the opportunity. And uh, so we came out with like a high-end line of cat furniture. Um, and the products that sold really well were the products that were already on the market, basically um, enclosures to hide litter or litter boxes. Okay. And so we made like a couple versions of those. Those always sold really well. Um, I had this version of what I call like the modern cat tower. Um, you know, people, um, probably a lot of our grandmas, they have these carpeted cat towers that sit in the corner of yeah. the room mm-hmm. and they like drag them into the closet when company comes over and drag them back out or they don't. Um, and so my, my idea was to make like a cool looking version of that and it totally flopped. Um, Part because I think it looked like a space a spaceship, and then the other part is because, you know, those products take a lot of consumer education, um, and I think that that's one of the things that we don't realize is like a new product it takes a lot of education, and so a lot of times it's great to be like a second or third mover um, because the first mover has to spend all the money educating the market as to what this new product is. So, what did that change for the future for you with this cat product? Um, we pretty much from that point on like solely focused on. Um, what I'll call like rip pivot jam, which is like you rip an idea or part of an idea, you do a little pivot and then you jam on it. So like with the valet parking equipment, like I said, you know, the companies that were making those, they were like completely welded units. So like after you rolled it over cobblestone for a while, like it would just completely disintegrate. We started making ours with um, componentry. So basically parts that were bolted together so you could replace them. Um, So like finding little innovations like that, I think is important to build a sustainable you know, we looked at that as like a sustainable company slash brand um, and probably less of like an e-commerce company. Sorry, I'm not super clear because I guess I'm curious. Sure. Like, so your point in general is like instead of trying to be breaking brand new, just copy someone and innovate on that. Yeah, that's that's pretty much the idea. And it's the same thing like we we're talking about before, which is like looking at Amazon listings and see what's working, what's not working. So. You know, a lot of people, um, they'll do that through Amazon, right? They'll like read comments, questions, reviews of products, and then they'll figure out how to build a better product. For me, like I've always been interested a little bit more in uh, B2B products and actually interfacing directly with the customer and having them tell me what's going on. So like that was one of the cool things in the bar industry for us was like people were so excited that we were developing products specifically for their industry. And then that we, I wanted to talk with that middle manager about that. Like no one had ever sat that guy down and said like, what do you want better in a bar? He's like, what the industry leaders coming to me asking me what I want better in a bar. And like, it was amazing the kind of feedback that we were able to get. And in turn, I think build the best products. So, 
you know, you can do some of that, I think, through reviews. Um, but one of the reasons I've kind of shied away as I've gone further and further in my career from consumer products is because it's very hard to get that kind of feedback to make better products. Hmm. Uh, Scott or Steve? It's interesting. I mean, my experience primarily lies in linens. And so like the biggest flops we've had have been like designs that we didn't really test and we just went ahead and bought some and, um, turns out like people didn't like them. So for example, um, our napkins, like we only sell white napkins pretty much today cause we tried to do, to do different colors. And, um, you know, today if I were to approach that differently, I would probably just email my list and say, Hey, you know, what are you guys interested in different color napkins instead of just going off and buying them? Um, in terms of Ian's comment about B2B and B2C, um, I, I find it pretty easy to get feedback from, from B2C customers, uh, just mainly via email, right? And you give them a list of designs and then you just have them vote on it or send out a survey. The B2B customers that we have, um, they tend not to give us any feedback, but maybe it's different because we sell napkins and that sort of thing. They're more interested in consistent service as well as lower prices. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think that, um, Steve, my experience could have been unique. And also, you know, we were selling like very high touch, very expensive products. Okay. Too. Okay. So I think that some of the difference could come there. Yeah. I think, I think, Steve, I think Steve brings up a great point though on that is like, and I think Ian does too. It's like, if you're going B2B, you know, you got more expensive products, obviously you got a different clientele. So, um, with the, with the, uh, the everyday customer, like, you know, especially in, in Steve's world with the linens and stuff, um, and, and Steve, you know, does a really good job too, I think with interacting with that email list that he has and stuff and he can get that direct. And I know, um, uh, Mike Jackness has done that Steve very well in his business with uh, the coloring book stuff and getting people's feedback and then not creating a coloring book versus, you know, what people actually want. Um, I, I think kind of going back to, I've got a couple, um, going way back. I mean, my wife and I dabbled in, um, selling physical, uh, props for photographers just cause we were buying them ourselves and backgrounds and backdrops and stuff like that. And I think the biggest thing comes down to for that, that we just guessed on design. Like we thought that people were going to like, similar to what Steve said, um, we were kind of B2B at that point because we were selling to people that were photographers like us um, and then having hand painted backgrounds and, and backdrops and stuff like that. Um, and then just certain type old, old antique type, um, you know, kind of like replica props for because we did a lot of family and baby photography. Um, so we use a lot of antique props and stuff like that. So I would say that would be one that I would say too, is just, we, we guessed, we didn't, we didn't see what the market really wanted. Um, and then the other one I'll just touch on too, is like, I, I had a great idea. Cause I, again, I think all of us have connections after you start getting into this stuff and had a, a guy that I thought would be a great fit for, um, supplements. And I got into that world, which I never, I never thought I would, I never wanted to. And, um, it kind of backfired on me just because, um, we were creating a better blend, a better brand. He was qualified. He was a nutritionist, licensed nutrition, all that stuff. Um, but then, um, the partnership didn't really pan out because he, uh, um, he, he just didn't live up to his end of the bargain. And then we kind of fell short with these, with these, uh, couple of supplements. Um, so I think there we weren't able to then kind of help the market. So it's like one of those things like now, what do we do? So we kind of backed out of that market. Um, so Again, I think uh, just your, your, your customers telling you what they want. And then if you're going to get involved in a partnership, know what you're getting involved in. The have you guys bought, have, have you guys had any crazy experiences where you like ordered an item from overseas or from someone and then like like a linen or, you know, valet thing that and it was totally botched or totally off? Dude, happened all the time. Mm. All um, the time. <laughs> here's what would happen. We would get samples and they would look great. And then we place a small order. Everything would look great. But then when we place the large order they would intersperse the crap with the good stuff. Um, this happened a lot uh, early on. And it actually did not stop until we actually flew to China and then we visited these guys. And after we did that, the quality just miraculously improved, at, at least in our experience. That's so interesting. Oh, excuse me. No, I was just going to say, Steve, I got just got a quick question on that. I mean, you went, you flew over and I, I get that, but would it, would it still have worked if you used like a third-party inspector to kind of go through those units before they were actually paid for and shipped? Absolutely. And this was before yeah. we started doing that. Okay. This is like back in 2008, gotcha. I would say. Okay. Yeah. Nowadays, yeah. it's so much easier. You hire a company for like 300 bucks. They go through your, your, uh, your, oh, stuff. I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's something to be said still about meeting sure. face to face. Oh yeah. I agree. Um, I agree. Like it helps in terms of pricing and it actually helps in terms of 
just getting stuff pushed through faster. Like for example, right now we don't even need to put any money down. They'll just produce our product and we'll just pay them once it's ready. Whereas traditionally you have to put like 30% down. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. And also for them to, to understand your vision too. You know, I've mm -hmm. had like many conversations in China, like, Oh yeah, you just want to order these handkerchiefs or whatever. It's like, no, this is my vision. This is what my company looks like. This is what we're trying to accomplish for our customers. I think that those conversations are helpful for them as well because, you know, they're flying blind in a lot of ways. Like they're just like making these things. And if you're like, no dude, like we're the highest quality premium manufacturer of this. Like we need you to take pride. We need to make sure that your factory is clean. These are our requirements. If you can't meet them, we're going to have to go somewhere else. And a lot of times they'll be accommodating, especially if your orders are increasing. So I think, I think giving these Chinese factories a, a vision helps them as well. And if you look at it from their perspective, they only want to work with people that are serious, right? They don't want like the one-offs. They want people who can drive uh, sustained business over the long haul. Sure. For well, l Let's go into some of the actual like sites that other people... So, well, finishing off the garbage can. So we have a garbage can. We do these things. We see if people want it. Let's go to some sites that have actually done it and they're past that part. They're actually selling a few of the things. They have their own websites. I've sent you guys a few, three links. Learn to solderkit.com, realham.com, and Cuvée Coffee. Why don't we start start at learn to solderkit.com? I guess I was just curious because you guys have seen so many websites. Like what you guys what would you guys recommend, you know, that you guys have done, you know, for e commerce sites of like, all right, here are the best practices that we'd recommend for these guys. So the first one is learn to solderkit.com. <laughs> Okay, so that's going to wrap up that episode. That's episode 353. So definitely go grab the transcripts, the show notes, and everything included in that part. That was part one, by the way, of that session, that round table. And that was really us kind of going through like the beginnings and then also like product brainstorming and and the garbage can, uh, you know, example that Noah came up with. And I, I think you can really see that there's there's definitely things that are happening as you're going through this process, but it is a process, right? And, you know, Noah's asking these questions and then Ian is chiming in with, you know, some of his thoughts from, from some of the things that he's done in the past and Steve and myself. So again, you may want to even listen to that again because product research, if you haven't really realized this yet, is one of the main things that you need to understand and it is a process. And there's ways to test and validate before you even launch a product. And that can be on, on Amazon like we've talked about or Etsy or eBay or any of those. And I think you can see a common thread there was to test and validate before you do a full-fledged like purchase on these things. I mean, Steve came up with a great idea to just do the samples, right? Just order the samples and then sell them on eBay. That's what he did and that's kind of how he was introduced to his market that he's now selling, you know, in, and he's been doing that for years now in seven figure business. So, uh, hopefully you got value from this. Now that's not all we are going to be now tearing down three websites and each of those websites is currently right now selling products. Some of them on Amazon, but some of them on their own website and, uh, they wanted some feedback as far as what they could do differently or what, uh, what they could maybe do moving forward that would increase sales or awareness of the brand. And you're going to be able to hear that in the next episode. Now, the next episode will be 354. And if you're listening to this on the day that this airs, well, it's going to take a couple days. It'll be published the following day or the day after, whenever you guys are listening to this. But just, it's 354 will be the episode. And that'll be part two. So you're definitely going to want to uh, pick up where we left off here because that's what we're going to do. And that there is another 35, 40 minutes of us tearing down these websites, talking about branding, talking about products, talking about all of the ins and the outs of a business that's already up and running and how to get more sales and also get more awareness. So you're definitely going to want to check out that. But again, to remind you guys, the show notes to this episode can be found at theamazingseller.com forward slash 353. And this is part one of this e-commerce roundtable that I did with Noah, Ian, Steve, and myself. And hopefully you guys are getting a ton of value from this. So guys, that's it. That's going to wrap up this episode. Remember, as always, I'm here for you. I believe in you and I'm rooting for you, but you have to, you have to come on, say it with me, say it loud, say it proud, take action. Have an awesome, amazing day. And I'll see you right back here on the next episode. <laughs>